How you guys doing, Legacy? You guys doing good? Yes? You doing well? Do you want to hear a fun fact about that video? It officially gave me a concussion, so your boy is concussed for tonight. So, um, yeah, there you go. I have a mild concussion as, per, as diagnosed by my doctor. So, um, but I said, you know what? We're still going to have church tonight, and I'm still spending my Wednesday night with y'all. And I would do it all again because that was so fun and so funny. So I would do it all again. And, uh, yeah, we are two weeks away. Everybody say two weeks. We are two weeks away from our fun June event, LYSKO, Legacy of Summer Kickoff. So like we were talking about, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll have everything water, slip and slides, water slides, a water obstacle course, which I didn't know was a thing. It is dope. It is really cool. And then if you bring the most first-time guests, bring the most friends with you in two weeks, you win a year's supply of Starbucks. So we're giving you the hookup. Somebody say, what up? There you go. We're giving you the hookup. So that's coming up. And then, of course, Legacy Summer Conference. Turn to your neighbor and say, LSC. LSC. LSC, not to be confused with anything else. But um, you heathens. Yep. And um, so excited for Legacy Summer Conference. It's going to be a blast. It's three days right here on site. And uh, we've got uh, services in the morning, evening, after parties every night time with your small group competitions. And then uh, days where we're going off site to take over the Coney Island Water Park and the Cincinnati Zoo. So it's a blast. It's only $1.99. That includes meals. That includes everything. So sign up. Turn to your neighbor and say, sign up. Sign up today. I don't know what you're waiting for, Brett. I don't know what you're waiting for, Gavin. Chick-fil-A will be fine without you for three days. I love you, but it will be okay for three days. So um, sign up, make that happen. And then lastly, also wanted to quickly touch on this next week is Heart the City Week. Of course, I love that our church is all about loving people year round. You know, how many of you know Heart the City happens year round? Um, but this is a time, this is a one week, June 20th through the 26th, where we as a church are saying, hey, everybody's gonna be in a project. Turn your neighbor and say, everybody. Everybody's going to be in a project. Everybody's going to be serving, and um, it starts this Sunday, the 20th, so we're going to be kicking it off. So uh, if you're able to, maybe get with your small group, talk to your leader. Let's do a project together. I think it would be so great if we could help out with every project or knock out a project as the Legacy Squad. So can we do that? Can we love our city? Can we love our communities and do that and serve this week? Let's do that. And uh, we're in our series, Good Vibes Only, right now. Good Vibes Only. It's summer. It's beautiful outside. I was walking around. It was like 80-some degrees, sunny. Somebody was saying, I hate summer. It's too hot. Well, it is. But you know what? It's still nice. But I'm in agreement. Fall is nice. But you know what? We're going to enjoy the season that we're in right now. And, you know, in talking about good vibes, I think a way that you can kill the vibe, if you're not careful, is really to have a failure to appreciate. I really do believe that failure to appreciate can kill the vibe of your life. And today I really want to talk to you about appreciating the miracles in your life and really specifically about how you're the miracle. If you could title this anything today, it would be You're the Miracle. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 14. Or if you're taking notes, I do hope you're taking notes tonight. John chapter 14 and beginning in verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is Jesus speaking here to his disciples, and ultimately through us today, through the book of John. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to go be with my father. And we just talked a lot about the Holy Spirit over the past few weeks. But Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to go to heaven. I've got to go be with my father. I've got to do things that only I can do. But don't panic. Don't freak out. Because all the miracles that I've done in my life, all the miracles that I've done, greater things. Somebody say greater. Greater things you will do. In January of 2007, a social experiment was done. And a world-renowned violinist went to a metro station in Washington, D.C. Undercover, he put on a ball cap, he put on glasses, and he went undercover 
in a specific area of this station where thousands of people walk by every single day. And for 45 minutes, he played some of Sebastian Bach's most famous, most memorable pieces on a $3.5 million violin. Here he sat undercover and he played the most beautiful pieces of music ever written for 45 minutes straight. To hear this exact arrangement just a couple days before, you would have had to pay $200 for a nosebleed seat. But here in this moment, in this metro station in Washington, D.C., only seven people would actually stop and take a moment to listen to him play. Not only that, he'd make a whopping $32.17 in tips in 45 minutes, $20 of which came from somebody who recognized who he was. And after 45 minutes of playing, 45 minutes of some of the most beautiful music on one of the most expensive instruments ever created, no applause, nothing. People just went on living their normal days. And the idea of this experiment, the purpose of it, really is that if we don't have time to stop and listen to one of the greatest musicians playing one of the finest pieces of music ever made on one of the most beautiful instruments ever made, then how many moments of life's most beautiful things do we walk by and go unnoticed every single day? How many miracles do we walk by every single day and totally pass them up? How many moments of life do we miss? See, all around us, we're experiencing the miraculous every single day, whether you realize it or not. Every one of us, all around us, we're experiencing moments to be grateful for, moments to see something miraculous, and yet we miss out on these things because we're not looking for them. Over time, it happens to all of us. We, we kind of lose our awareness of the miraculous. G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton said and was quoted by saying, it is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon, that the, recep the re repetition in nature may not be a mere recurrence, but it might be a theatrical encore. It could be a miracle in and of itself that the sun rises every day and the moon rises every evening, but over time, we get clouded by the customary. We get used to this thing called life, and over time, we lose our awe of the Lord. We lose our awe of how God works in our life. For example, right now, if you look across this room, it appears that everybody, hey, Miss Aaliyah, I'm gonna ask you to put your phone away because you know better than that. And you're taking pictures and the flash is going off. I might be concussed, but I'm perceptive. So please lean into this moment. Right now, and silence your phone too while you're at it, thank you. <laughs> you good? You with me? Everybody take a deep breath, release the tension. <sighs> it's okay. I always tell you every week, I want to treat you like an adult. If you act like a kid, you're going to get treated like a kid. Think about it in this room right now. If you look across this room, everybody looks like we're sitting completely still, right? But what you don't know is that currently it's a miracle because the earth's axis is spinning right now at over 1,000 miles an hour. Isn't that crazy? It looks like we're still, but it's not. Every 24 hours, the earth spins a complete 360 degrees. Right now, we're also flying through space at a whopping 67,108 miles an hour. That's 87 times faster than the speed of sound. Every day, even if you don't get out of bed once, you're traveling 1,599,793 miles through space. On top of that, we're part of the Milky Way that's spinning at an alarming rate of 483,000 miles per hour. If that's not a miracle, y'all, I don't know what is. Like, we're living in a miracle right now. All of us, we have faith to believe in these biggest miracles, the miracle of the sun rising, the miracle of when you get out of bed, your feet touch the ground, and you don't just float off into space because of a thing called gravity. That's kind of a miracle. We believe in these massive miracles that we experience every day, yet we doubt God in the small things. We doubt God in the small things. We believe in that. We believe that the earth's axis is spinning and all of that, but we doubt God when it comes to healing that we need in our own life. We believe God in some of the big things, but we doubt him in the areas where we need freedom from addiction. We think God could never free me from this addiction. I could never break free from this. Things like I need God to open this door in my life. Things like that seem impossible. We doubt that God can come through. We doubt that God can come through in our dreams, in our goals, in our relationships, in our unique situations. 
You know, what about you personally? You, you are a miracle. Whether you realize it or not, you have trillions of chemical reactions going off right now that are taking place in your body every second of every day. You're inhaling oxygen. You're metabolizing energy. You're managing your equilibrium. Right now, you're manufacturing hormones, some of you too many. You're fighting antigens. You're filtering stimuli, mending tissue. All of this is happening at the exact same time. Turn to your neighbor, say, you're a miracle. Say, I'm a miracle. All of this takes place while your brain performs, this is a real number, up to 10 quadrillion calculations every second. To put this into perspective, if a computer could do everything that your body does, it would take a nuclear power plant to pull off just the same performance. And yet, I know people all the time that say, I've never seen a miracle, I don't believe in miracles. Well, you are a miracle. You are a miracle. You can't say that you don't believe in miracles. They're around us every single day, and more importantly, you're the miracle. Every time you look in a mirror, you're looking at a miracle. David says in Psalms 139 that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that there's no one like you. There's never been anybody like you. You're unique. There will never be anybody like you. You're a unique miracle to God. That's how he's created you. Well, what's What's your point, Luke? I get it. You're talking. What's your point? I've got a real life. I've got real problems. I've got real things that I'm going through. I've got real things that I'm facing. What's your point? Well, let's be honest. You know, we as Christians, we as believers, we can get so caught up in life and we can lose, really lose the sense that God is still performing miracles. Really lose the sense that God is a God of miracles. We have to remember that we are walking, talking, living miracles. And God still wants to perform miracles in our lives and perform miracles through our lives. I've done this enough times to know that right now during this service, right now, even as I'm speaking here in Florence, there in Cincinnati, right now as I'm speaking, there are people in a place. You're in a place in your life and you need a miracle. You're at a place in your life and you don't know what you're gonna do if God doesn't come through. You don't know what you're gonna do. You need a miracle. You're desperate, you feel lost, you feel lonely. You feel discouraged and you need a miracle. Whether you know it or not, most of the time, we are the miracle that somebody else is looking for. I'm gonna say that again. You could be the miracle that somebody else is looking for. You could be that friend that somebody else has been praying so desperately for. You could be that word of encouragement that somebody's waking up every day so desperately craving for and that's the miracle. They have no peace, they have no hope, they have no joy, yet we carry that peace, that great joy, that great hope that comes from the Lord, and you can be that miracle to somebody else. You can be that to somebody else. There's no circumstance that's too dark. There's no situation that's too far gone or no relationship that's too damaged. We serve a God of miracles. We have a tendency over time to doubt that God still wants to do miracles. In 1804, there was what's called the Jefferson Bible, and it was Thomas Jefferson who took a Bible and a pair of scissors, and he went through the entire Bible, and he began to cut out every miracle that he read in the Bible. He would cut out everything from Noah and the ark, because how could, how could God flood the earth and give a man instructions to save two of every animal. He didn't believe it, so he cut it out. He would cut out everything from Moses parting the Red Sea to the virgin birth to even the resurrection of Jesus. And he began to tear out pages and cut them out. And the Jefferson Bible became a Bible that was void of all of the miraculous. If you read the book of John in the Jefferson Bible, it would end with Jesus dying on a cross and being buried in the grave, the end. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 says it like this. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. What the scripture is saying is, hey, if, you're, if, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, if you don't believe in the miraculous power that's in the word, we have no substance to our faith. We've got no validity to what we believe in. And you might say, oh yeah, I'm not gonna cut out things in the Bible like the resurrection, but we do in our own way. We cut out the miraculous from our everyday life and we think God could never do that for me. 
And in your own way, you get out scissors and you begin to cut out what God could do in your life. Yeah, I read those stories and I believe that Jesus is raised from the dead, but I don't believe he can free me from this. I believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, but I don't believe that he can heal my family, not what we've been through. I believe in the miracles that I read about in the word, but I don't see how God could ever get me through this. We, we rip out what God is able to do. We cut out what God is capable of doing and we subtract the miraculous from our own life every single day. And here's what ends up happening. You have a wise God, a wise Jesus, but to you, he's a weak God and a weak Jesus. And that's just not the God I know about. We have a compassionate God, but he's a passive God. It's not that we don't think he can do these things, but we just don't think that he can do them for us. We think that he's great and he's loving, but somehow we cut ourselves out of the miraculous storybook that is our lives. But Jesus said, greater works will you do. Somebody say greater. Greater works will you do. You shall do greater works. And I believe that as you lean into his word, lean into your relationship with him, you'll watch God use you and you'll do things in your life and it'll be a life that's described in no other way but a miracle. If you're like me, you know, maybe you're like the man who told Jesus, hey, I believe, but help my unbelief. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord, but I, I, I'm still struggling with doubt. I believe but I've been disappointed in my life. I believe in Jesus, but I've been so hurt. I believe in Jesus, but I've been so let down in my life. This had to happen, and this is going on, and I believe, but why did my family have to go through this? I believe, but why did my dad have to leave? I believe, but why am I struggling? Why did this happen? And many times in life, you have to believe from a place of uncertainty, if you're anything like me. There's things in my life right now I'm still believing for, I don't have an answer for, and I'm praying daily for, and I don't have an answer for it yet. John 20, 31 says, but these things are written that you might believe. These miracles are written in the word. We're hearing about these miracles. We're hearing about them so that you could believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that the Son of God is real, and by believing, you may have life in his name. So we read about these miracles in the Bible to be encouraged and know that, hey, those stories that you read about, that's not just supposed to stay in this book. It's supposed to be alive and active and working in your life. This is living, the breathing word of God. The reason we read about these miracles, it's to reveal what Jesus wants to do in your life. We, we hear about the centurion's servant or excuse me, the servant that got Jesus to tell him about the centurion's daughter that was dead and sick. Getting my stories mixed up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Concussion, right? <laughs> John's laughing because he knows the Bible and he knows I messed it up. <laughs> Everybody else was like, yes, I'm following you. I'm tracking. <laughs> I think about the parents who had their daughter who was sick and we talked about it last week when Jesus had to put the professional mourners, the professional complainers outside. See, in that moment, we hear about those moments where Jesus can raise a dead girl to life, not just so it can be a cool story that encourages us, but so that we can know there's gonna be dead things in your own life that God can still speak and bring life to. <laughs> Told you I'd get it. The truth is the Gospel of John was written not with a period at the end of it, not with an exclamation point, not with a question mark. It was written with a comma because the story continues in your life today. It's not the finishing line, it's the starting line. It's like salvation. When you get saved, that's not the end. That's just the beginning of the miraculous life God wants to bring you into. It's the beginning. And the miracle I wanna talk to you briefly about tonight is when Jesus turned water into wine. I love this miracle because it's a practical miracle. It's a practical miracle. Think about it. This is not a life and death miracle. Everybody's fine if they don't drink more wine at the end of the day. <laughs> They're okay. This is, this is a miracle everybody would walk home from completely fine. But this miracle is, excuse me, a miracle concerning the reputation of the family. The parents here, they had a heart to provide a great wedding, a great feast. A great reception for their child getting married. And they run out of wine at this wedding, which would look bad for the family. It would look poor on their part. 
And I love this. This first miracle shows that not every miracle God wants to do in your life has to be this big, grand, life and death thing, the heaven and hell thing. God is actually interested in doing very real, very practical miracles in your own life. We think that miracles have to be someday I'm going to wake up and I'm just going to have abs. That'd be a miracle. Zap, I have abs. It's like, no. God's given you the miracle of access to a healthy diet and the gym. And you can access that miracle. But it's very practical. But I love how this miracle begins. It begins with an interesting statement. See, Jesus and his mother, they're at a wedding. The wedding's going on. They run out of wine, and Mary gets her son, Jesus, and she says, hey, Jesus, why don't you, why don't you do your thing? Do your, little, do your little miracle thing. And he turns to her, and he says, no, my hour has not yet come. My hour's not yet here. I, I love side note about this real quick. I wasn't even gonna talk about this, but I love how after that happens, Jesus is like, fine, I'll do the miracle and he gives instruction and tells them, go and fill some water pots. Miracles require participation. I'm gonna say that again. Miracles require participation. I think too many people are just sitting back, living their lives, saying, well, if God's this miracle worker, he better do everything in my life, but you're not willing to take any action. I'm waiting for God to speak to me, but you don't ever open his word. I'm waiting for God to do something for me, but you're not willing to serve at church. Oh, it got quiet. That's for somebody. Miracles require participation. Sometimes it's not a matter of God not wanting to bless you. God wants to bless you and open the floodgates of heaven on your life. But he's saying, hey, I need you to participate. I need you to have some skin in the game. You don't have to worry about turning the water into wine, but can you go get some water pots? Can you go fill these pots with water? Do You do the natural. I'll do the super. You just give me a little bit of faith. I can do the rest. But it's going to require a little bit of participation. So back to the sentence, he spoke, he says, it's not yet my time, it's not yet my hour. I love this, because Jesus lived his life before that miracle, this was his first miracle, but he lived his life with the sense that there was purpose to his life. He didn't live his life on accident, he lived his life on purpose. Do you live your life with purpose? Do you live your life with vision for your future? Do you live your life with purpose? Do you make relationship decisions with purpose? Do you make decisions in your life with purpose? Or are you just living day to day, trying to get by day to day to day, living for the next high, living for the next party, living for the next thing to just fulfill your immediate need? Or do you live your life with purpose? You have to remember that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human, meaning that he was tempted in every way imaginable. In every way that you and I could ever experience temptation, Jesus was tempted, Jesus struggled, yet he did not sin. In the same way, Jesus would have struggled with his identity his whole life. You can see that play out when he was in the wilderness, when he was led by the Holy Spirit and tempted by the devil. If you really are the son of God, then do this. If you really are the son of God, turn that stone to bread. If you really are the son of God. Jesus was tempted with identity. Even at 12 years old, see Jesus and his parents, they were on their way to a feast, a annual feast, and there's, his parents go along and Jesus decides to linger back and he sneaks off to the temple where he's there for about a week. And in this moment, he's in the temple, he's in the house of God, and the Bible actually says that the way he spoke, the way he talked about scriptures, the way he spoke astonished people. Not, not his peers, not astonished the other 12-year-olds that were there. It, the Bible actually says that it astonished the elders, the pastors, the elites of that time that were there. Jesus, at 12 years old, was in an environment where people could speak to his potential. Even at 12 years old, they would pull Mary aside and they would begin to tell her, man, we're astonished at what Jesus is saying. We're astonished at what this young man knows even at his age. And it's important to know, legacy, that even at 12 years old, Jesus realized that he had purpose for his life. I'm not saying that it happened in this particular moment. But something did happen when he was 12 that elevated how he would live from that point on. Something happened in his life that said, hey, I'm meant for more in my life. I've got purpose in my life, so I better live like I do. I better make choices like I've got purpose. I don't want to waste my relationships. They began to say what was special about Jesus. They began to say, man, he's a great teacher. 
They began to say what astonished him. And they spoke to those gifts in Jesus at just 12 years old. I think somebody needs to know, don't wait till you're older to be great. You can be a world changer right now from where you're at, on your team, in your school, in your family, in your neighborhood. I hate that. I'm going to wait till I'm older. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to party. I talk to people in college all the time. They're like, I'm just going to get my party years out of the way now, and then I'm going to love Jesus. Who says that living for Jesus isn't the best life? Because I can tell you, I've tried a whole lot of other things. I've tried to find joy in a whole lot, but nothing compares to the joy of the Lord. And whoever says loving God ain't fun, they ain't doing it right. They are not doing it right. Jesus lived his life with a sense of purpose, even from 12 years old. In other words, if you're ever gonna see the miraculous in your life, if you wanna see God work miraculously in your life, even just a water to wine kind of miracle, not necessarily a big miracle, but if you're ever gonna come to that place you got to have moments where you get a revelation of your destiny. You get just a glimpse of the purpose for your life. One of the greatest things that can happen to you is you get a revelation of the purpose for your life. I'm, I'm closing with this. I'm almost done. I'm almost wrapped up. Just give me a few more moments. But the reason a lot of people never experience the miraculous, the reason a lot of people have the miraculous go by them completely unnoticed, the truth is they don't have a sense of purpose in their life. The truth is they're waiting for the miraculous, but you're living aimlessly. You're living like there is no meaning to this thing called life, like there is no purpose. You're aimless. You might be a Christian, you might be saved, you might be in church, but you live aimlessly purposelessly live without direction because you've never had a moment like Jesus had. You know, maybe, maybe you had the opposite. Jesus had this particular moment when he was 12 years old and the leaders and the people there began to speak potential to him, began to speak what he could be, began to speak to his gifts. Maybe you had the opposite. Maybe you had moments in your life where people spoke negatively over you. Now, I've done this enough to know how powerful words are. People say, oh, sticks and stones, they might break my bones. That's wrong, man. Words are deadly. Words, I would say, can be destiny killers if left unchecked. Words are powerful. And maybe you've had the opposite. Maybe you've had negative words spoken over you, a lack of potential. And it's not that you can't begin to see what we're talking about, but it's because you've been living based on what others have said about you. You've been living your life based on what that ex said about you. Been living your life, maybe that negative comment that that parent said about you. You've been living your life based on a wrong presumption, but Jesus at the age of of 12 had men and women that would speak to his God-given potential, and in the same way, I need to tell you, you're gonna find that at Seven Hills. You're gonna have small group leaders and volunteers that will speak to your potential and say, It's not too late. You're not too far gone. You've you've got great potential. I can remember when I was 16 years old. You know, many of you have probably heard this before, but this is is how I grew up. It's not that I had a, a bad childhood. I had just a purposeless life. I didn't live with purpose. I was never a good student. I barely got by. I was told that if my grades were any indication of my future, I should be in big trouble. And I just remember living without purpose. And, and when, when you don't really stand for anything, you'll fall for anything. So I didn't have any purpose to stand for in my life. I never knew I wanted to be a preacher. I never, never in a million years would have thought that. I never knew what I wanted to do. I just kind of lived without purpose, without direction. So what, what, what do you do when you live without purpose? You, you want great things for your life. You want great things to happen to you. But because I wasn't putting any work in, any effort in, I I just fell for anything. I fell for all the wrong relationships. Wondered why I got cheated on, twice. I didn't have anything to stand for, so I wonder why I fell into addiction. I didn't have anything to stand for, so I wondered why I fell into depression. I didn't have purpose in my life. 
And I remember being 16 years old, coming to a service like this, right here at Legacy, and my life was changed. And I began to get around my youth pastors, and I began to get around my small group leaders and people and good friends, where they began to speak to my potential and say, Luke, you're a really good speaker. Luke, I love the way you think. Luke, do you realize that when you speak, people listen? When you go, people follow? Do you realize you've got leadership potential? Do you realize that? And these are things I just never heard before, and I'm, I'm hearing these things. and I'm saying, man, if these great people are seeing something in me, maybe, maybe, there, maybe there is something great for my future. I didn't have it all together. I was just some dumb kid. Can I tell you, it's a miracle I'm here today. It's a miracle that some loser 16-year-old said yes to Jesus because my life was changed. Your life might not be perfect right now, but it's a miracle because you're here. You're in God's house on a Wednesday night. You're a miracle. Maybe it's time you start getting around some people that see the potential in you. Maybe it's time you stop hanging around with people that don't have purpose in their life. It's time you stop being around people that just live without direction, without aim, and they're just careless with their life. Can I tell you, if people are careless with their life, they're gonna be careless with yours. And we think it's fun. Oh, I'm in high school, I'm in middle school. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Things you're doing right now, the choices you're making right now, they impact your future. I'm glad I made some right choices at 16. I'm glad I, in moments of uncertainty, said yes to Jesus. I didn't have it all figured out. I didn't know what my life was gonna look like, but I just got a glimpse. I never, never would have been able to tell you this is how my life looked, would look when I was 16 years old, never. I would have thought this was an impossibility. I would have thought this was a closed door. And I don't know what it is you're dreaming for, what it is you have envisioned for your future. But my prayer is that tonight in this service, you would begin to get a glimpse. You just, just have the slightest perception of what God could do. I love it because that's all he needs. He says, hey, just go fill the water buckets. I, I, I'll do the rest. Okay, I don't know how this is going to turn into wine, Jesus. Kind of crazy. Just filling up a bucket with water. I don't know what God is asking of you tonight. Every eye closed, every head bowed. but I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to some people tonight. I believe he's speaking to you. Maybe you've allowed the wrong things to be said and be spoken to you. And you've bought into those things. But you're here tonight, and that's a miracle. I don't know what it is you're asking God for in your life. I don't know what, what it is that you need in your life. But I'm here to tell you that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't know him as your Lord, as your Savior. You've heard about him. But you don't know him as your personal Savior. Can I tell you that the greatest miracle God ever performed was sending his son Jesus and while we were still sinners, 
God sacrificed his son for us so that you and I might have everlasting life. See, you and I were born separated from God, cursed by sin. And a sacrifice was needed to cover that sin. And Jesus became that ultimate sacrifice. He lived a perfect life. He died a gruesome death on a cross. He was buried in the grave, but he didn't stay in the grave. He rose again on the third day, defeating death and sin for you. And the Bible's clear that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, and you confess with your mouth that in that moment, the greatest miracle occurs, and it's the miracle of salvation. The miracle that when God the Father looks at you, he doesn't see you, he doesn't see the mistakes, he doesn't see the shortcomings, he doesn't see the sin. He sees his son Jesus saying, I died for him. I died for her. And if you're here tonight and you say, Luke, I need to get right with Jesus. I need a relationship with him. There's nobody looking around right now. But if that's you, you'd say, Luke, I want to make that decision. I'm going to ask that you slip up your hand on the count of three. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to humiliate you. I just want to know who I'm praying for and who I'm believing with. On the count of three, you say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. One, two, three. Right now, slip that hand up. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Praise God. Anybody else? I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. We're all going to put one hand over our heart, and we're going to pray this prayer together with those that raise their hands. Say, Jesus, I believe that you're God's only son. I believe that you lived a perfect life, that you died a gruesome death on a cross for my sin, for my shame. I believe that you rose again from the dead to defeat death, hell, and sin for me. I ask that you wash me, cleanse me, give me a brand new start and a brand new beginning. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my heart, and I will follow you for all the days of my life. Father, right now I pray for every person that prayed that prayer and every person under the sound of my voice right now. God, would you begin to bring vision to our lives? I speak purpose and vision in Jesus' name. Lord, would you, be give, would you begin to give each of these young people a glimpse of, of the bright future, the bright potential that you have for them. Lord, I know it seems dark right now. I know it seems dark right now, lost right now, hopeless right now. God, but you've prepared our days. Lord, you go before us and you're leading us into a bright future, a future filled with hope, filled with joy. Lord, I speak to the potential of these great young people in this room. Lord, I believe this is the greatest generation Holy Spirit, I believe that with your guidance, this generation will do greater things. Will do greater things. Greater things than we read in the word. Greater things that have been done in previous generations. Lord, I thank you for the great work you're doing in our lives. Lord, continue to give us vision, purpose. Much like your son Jesus, just at 12 years old when he had people that spoke life into him, that spoke to his gifts. Lord, would you use the people in our lives to continue to speak to our potential, speak to our gifts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Come on, we all said a big amen. Give Jesus some praise tonight. Amen. Well, hey, look, if you made that decision tonight, can I just tell you, that's the greatest miracle. The greatest decision you could ever make in your life is saying yes to Jesus. Because the Bible says that if you seek God first, what does that mean? If you put him first, your relationship with him first, your time in the word first, being planted in his house, the church first, all else will be added unto you. So I don't know what it is you're praying God for, I don't know what miracle you're seeking for, but I can tell you with full confidence, because I've seen it in my life, I've seen it in the lives of countless others. If you seek him first, 
He'll take care of you. He will take care of you. It's going to take participation. I don't know what that means. Maybe that participation is just being in the Word. I would encourage you. If you don't have a Bible, get with our team. Get with your leader. Get with our team in the lobby. We've got Bibles here. I will get you a copy. Maybe that's jumping into a small group. Maybe that's signing up for something. Maybe that's serving on our student dream team. Maybe that's getting involved with the church. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I promise you, if you seek him first, all else will be added unto you. Amen. Y'all believe that tonight? Come on, let's give it up for the word one more time. Hey, we love you. You're the very best. You're dismissed, and we'll see you next week.